Welcome, and thank you, Tom. Uh, for about 150 years, when this choir and this uh, organ has uh, done its marvelous dust, just as uh, Tom has uh, done, I can imagine that there's been, I know that there's been plenty of pastors, Dave, Paul, and others, who have said amen, and we might as well just uh, close in uh, prayer and leave, because uh, that's uh, so great. And I would love for a mic drop like that. Uh, but. There isn't going to be one, but we are going to hear from Tom some more, so I appreciate that. Um, I do thank you all for being here during this um, uh, Victorian Festival and giving us an opportunity to uh, share with you our 150th year uh, as a church here on the corner of uh, Franklin uh, Street in uptown Port Townsend. I'm Steve Shively. Tom Stahl is our organist uh, with us today, and my technology has failed me already, so I will um, uh, go back here. And we will start uh, first off with uh, a land acknowledgement. And um, if you'll just uh, follow along with that land acknowledgement, we begin our gathering by acknowledging the first residents and the stewards of this land. We acknowledge that the land we now use for worship and for service here in Port Townsend is on the traditional homeland of the Sklalem and the Chimicum people. We commit to uplifting indigenous voices long silenced and we pledge to honor in word and in deed the creator, the original stewards of this land, and the creation that they hold dear. Thank you. Our goal is today to cover in uh, a very short period of time, uh, 150 years of what's been happening uh, in these walls. And uh, this is a unique uh, a sanctuary. It is also what we consider an incubator for um, worship and work outside of these walls uh, in the greater community. And so I want to share with you a little bit about that. But it starts uh, back in the beginning, and for us, that was uh, pre-1873 when this church was founded. Um, it was started uh, fresh on the heels of the American Civil War having just concluded. Port Townsend as a whole was a very active mix of the uptown refinement and nobility, as some of you in Victorian uh, uh, garb are appropriately uh, showing the splendor of. And then down in uh, downtown was full of debauchery, sh uh, Shanghais, prostitutes, migrant Chinese, vilified Native American encampments, and plenty of business. And it was the commerce that fueled Port Townsend into the key city status and the port of call for commerce uh, as America was aggressively moving to this brand new West. As you came into Port Townsend uh, from ship, you saw uh, the bell tower, which is a point of uh, landmark, and it's right at the top of the Howyer Fountain steps. And then you could also see the steeple of First Press Port Townsend. And um, separated by only attitude and at altitude, those still very steep Howyer uh, steps dignified the uptown corner of Franklin and Polk. And surely it was the talk of the town when on Saturday, March 8th, 1873, the original charter to organize this church was signed, and it was signed by seven women. Yes, seven women uh, uh, signed it. Um, these brave women, um, we don't know a whole lot about them. We are beginning to learn a little bit more about uh, who they are. We don't know if their husbands were standing by their sides uh, in this radical decision to uh, charter a, a church uptown. We don't know if the husbands were um, uh, down at the bars and the taverns, uh, given uh, a sharp elbow, what, what in the heck's going on uptown or not. Um, but we do know that um, they were moved. We don't know specifically if it, what was going on, if they were moved uh, by the Holy Spirit or if they were moved by the protests of the current rulings that were going on uh, in um, the other Washington. And uh, because the 13th and the 15th Amendments of the Constitution had just passed, giving um, uh, rights to African Americans, uh, giving rights to uh, natives, but uh, still, long, long, many years until rights for women. And so uh, we don't know exactly what the whole reason uh, was, but uh, we know that looking around um, uh, that these uh, seven women in 1873 had a lot of um, uh, reason and rationale. And I just want to give you a lens of what was going on in 1873. Starting a little bit before that, 1865, the Civil War ended, the 13th Amendment abolishing slavery was assigned. 1870, just three years before our chartering, the 15th Amendment granted African-American men the right to vote. 
1872 as a point of context, uh, President Ulysses S. Grant signed legislation making Yosemite the first national park uh, of our uh, United States. And in 1873, a lot uh, did happen. Um, the panic, which was the precursor to the Great Depression, uh, hit the stock markets and hit the economy across uh, America. Queen Victoria was on the throne in jolly old England. The first electrical system was built and installed by Thomas Edison uh, in New Jersey. It would be years before uh, that technology would um, uh, be confident enough and would catch on and would uh, come uh, here to the West Coast. Uh, entertainment was flourishing with P.T. Barnum, uh, circus, vaudeville theaters. They were both brand new. They were both opening for the first time in 1873. Uh, Remington and Sons uh, started production of this brand new fangled thing called the typewriter, uh, and it sold for over $5,000. Take that in point of context, $5,000 in 1873. This organ cost $2,500 uh, uh, a few years after that. So uh, the typewriter was far more uh, uh, pricely than uh, the tracker organ that we enjoy today. Uh, Levi Strauss was granted a patent uh, to put copper rivets in these denim work pants, and uh, uh, he, his, uh, he has made good money on that patent, uh, as his heirs have since then. And then uh, Coors started brewing in Golden, Colorado, and um, Central Park was officially completed in New York City by the Olmsted brothers uh, as the architects. They're also the influencers and uh, help correspond. If you uh, are visiting, make sure you visit Ch Chetsamoka uh, Park because Chetsamoka was uh, an Olmsted brother uh, design right along the same uh, ilk as uh, Central Park. Uh, after 1873, uh, telephone um, was invented in 1875, the light bulb uh, to go along with Edison's uh, electrical lighting system, 1879. Uh, Washington became a state in 1889. We were just a territory of Oregon in 1873 when uh, the charter was signed for this, uh, this church. The great flu uh, pandemic, better known as the Spanish flu, or as we uh, post-COVID uh, uh, have other slang names uh, uh, for the COVID pandemic, 18, 1918. And we really don't know what happened in uh, Port Townsend or in this church in 1819. We don't know how this congregation responded. Um, uh, Margie and some of the others uh, of this congregation now are just starting the whole process to make sure we document what we did during the COVID uh, of the last couple years so that 150 years from now there will be records and uh, people will know what the heck uh, we did and we struggled and we, um, uh, we did some things right, we did a whole lot of things wrong uh, during it. But we have really no idea what this congregation did other than survive somehow uh, the uh, Spanish flu of 18, 1918, excuse me. Uh, finally, in 1920, the 19th Amendment was um, uh, to the Constitution, gave women the right to vote. And uh, then also the U.S. Supreme Court in 1947 um, codified the Establishment Clause, which is uh, better known as a separation of church and state. And the reason I give us this lens of what happened before and after is because we come biased with, well, that's the way it's always been. Well, until 1947, this church and churches as a whole were given the permission and they were a part of the fabric of the community in a much different way. And we'll uh, talk about that in a little bit more about uh, how the pastors just didn't lead from the pulpit of this sanctuary, but they led in town. Uh, they were um, uh, city councilors, they sat on school boards, they did a whole variety of other things that in today's um, um, post-1947, you just wouldn't think about. So take those things into consideration, take uh, 1873 and those seven women um, and somewhere in there, some of those are some of those original seven. We don't have them identified right there. But that motley looking crew is a very brave, brave crew uh, to be able to uh, take that step, take that bold step in context of what was going on uh, back then uh, and to a charter. And uh, I agree with um, the statement that the late uh, John Lewis said, never be afraid to make some noise and get into good trouble, good necessary trouble. And um, those uh, seven ladies ladies definitely did that. Um, they were um, magnificent in their trouble, and uh, as 
the author Peter Simpson in his 1986 uh, book, The City of Dreams, A Guide to Port Townsend, he read uh, this, he wrote this about Port Townsend. In 1889, at the peak of Port Townsend's economic boom, the 16-year young congregation of the First Presbyterian dedicated a brand new building uh, as its original church building. The first house of worship north of the Columbia to be built fully of stone had become too small to accommodate its growing congregation, now numbering approximately 100 souls. Um, the conversation was, did, it, did the congregation outgrow the original stone church uh, or did Port Townsend and its greatness and uh, its um, prestige as being the New York of the West Coast, did that elevate the congregation of only 100 to say, well, that our stone church is nice, but we need to be bigger. We need to have broader shoulders. We need to have a larger uh, uh, a sanctuary to be able to um, complement where Port Townsend is going. And this shows the original stone church. It shows the original manse. There was a 1970s era manse uh, that uh, houses Echo, uh, Ecumenical Helping Hands, uh, right out here. But uh, that uh, profile uh, shows the original church. And uh, the manse, as you can see there, and as you can see um, uh, in the next slide, uh, uh, indicates it, where, this where this sanctuary is. The um, 1880s, the boom for Port Townsend was definitely on, and it was, uh, in, it was in its own mind's eye ready to outgrow Seattle. To keep pace with the growing uh, community, it finally decided to erect a new church building under the leadership of then-pastor T.T. Uh, Carmen, who was um, originally installed as a pastor in 1887. Uh, Dr. Curran uh, had a wide and varied experience, but he came to Port Townsend having just finished serving the First Presbyterian Church of Gettysburg. And uh, in that Gettysburg, his church was uh, very much in the midst of that uh, Civil War battle. And uh, that church, his church, became a hospital during uh, that bloody fight. And uh, Pastor uh, D.T. worked diligently among the wounded and the di dying to become um, a lot and the church became a point of um, a salvation and a, a hospital for a Gettysburg. I contend that the uh, pastor brought that Gettysburg reality to the building committee of this church, and uh, they had that point and they had that decision, do we make this a mausoleum, do we make this a museum, or do we make this truly a working church uh, for the uh, good? And he, I'm sure, shared those uh, stories of um, uh, what happened and what transpired in Gettysburg. But um, uh, they uh, commissioned the new church, and they commissioned the new church in a very um, uh, fan fell way. Um, they laid the cornerstone for it. And uh, here is a um, article that was 1875 when the original stone church cornerstone was laid, and it was in the Weekly Argus, which was the local newspaper that predated the um, Port Townsend leader. And uh, it goes on and it talks about the edifice and it talks about uh, the day and uh, so forth. And it goes on and it says, soon was heard the roll of the drum announcing the marshalling of the order for their work. And but a few appeared upon the brow of the hill, marching in procession to the scene of interest. Arrived upon the spot, they were uh, conducted to the platform erected for the occasion upon which was laid a neat carpet and on the same carpet was placed and occupied for the fraternity. That fraternity was the uh, order of Masons. Also an organ surrounded in the Sunday school scholars and the teachers, um, and they uh, started with welcoming the honorable Freemasons. They also had um, members of the uh, um, Chimicum tribe, and they had uh, members from um, the Episcopal Church, which was the preceding church uh, to uh, First Pressport Townsend. And uh, they placed in there, in the uh, cornerstone, the following. First, Paul, uh, First Paul's Episcopal Church, the Presbytery of Oregon, which was the mission connected to uh, this church, various lodges and masons, uh, certificates taking part in the ceremony and laying the cornerstone, business cards from various business houses uh, listing all the merchants, hotels, and physicians of the day, listing of all the town officers, the superintendents of school, the county commissioners, 
The history of Port Townsend from its earliest settlement with a recording of the first child uh, born, the first wedding, and the first uh, building. The first child, you may want to know, is um, uh, C.G. Klinger, and she was born October 24th, 1852. It also turns out that that was a common piece that any time there was a ribbon cutting, it wouldn't be that you'd have the Chamber of Commerce here, but you'd have the first uh, child born in town, you'd have the first couple married, and you'd have the owner of the first building. And so, uh, Miss, uh, so she uh, spent her days, and she uh, lived uh, into a ripe uh, age, but uh, she was at basically every um, building being uh, lotted as the first uh, child born in, uh, in Port Townsend. Um, today, it's uh, a ribbon and a, uh, a Chamber of Commerce piece. Um, full statements by the Revenue Service, um, the lighthouse keepers, the officers, um, the Fort Townsend, because this predated Fort Warden, uh, uh, Fort Casey, and Fort Flagler. Fort Townsend, a full listing of the officers of, of that uh, um, base were there. Photographs, uh, specimens of dried sea mosses and immortals are in there. A 50 cent silver piece with that year's uh, coinage. Original copies of the correspondence. Uh, shorter catechism of the Westminster uh, Confessional. Uh, the Lord's Prayer. And copies and bylaws of the Mason's Lodge of Port Townsend. And then um, in 1889 when they um, put the cornerstone for this sanctuary. That cornerstone is actually right out here uh, in this corner uh, behind the sign in the, in the roadie bushes. They took the cast out, and as it says on July 6, 1889, uh, they opened the original stone one, uh, they examined it, they, uh, are, um, they inventoried it, they put back in uh, additional copies of the current Daily Argus, the Daily Call, a copy of the Seattle Post Intelligencer, and they lowered uh, those items into this uh, 1889 cornerstone. Uh, the foundation of uh, this church is built upon the stones of the original church. And uh, uh, with that, they also, um, not only having the pastor with his Gettysburg uh, influences, they also were in uh, Victoria Port Townsend and any Victorian house worth its salt has no less than three colors of paint, and many of them have eight, nine, and up to 13 colors of paint. And the church probably felt that that was a little uh, ostentatious, uh, and so instead of having multiple hues and multiple colors of paint on the exterior, they went uh, with the most prominent uh, architectural firm of the day with Port Townsend, and they said, we still wanna make a statement. And so the statement they made was by using not just one, not just two, but three styles of architecture uh, in the design. And uh, so that was uh, its main uh, call, was not its uh, color palette, but was the fact that um, they had three styles, Gothic, Queen Anne, and Stick. And so uh, Gothic is depicted in the steeply pitched roof and the pointed arches, and uh, its windows are characteristic of those of the Gothic, Gothic style. The overhanging eaves, the horizontal boards, and the use of shingles on the bell tower signify the stick style of design. And then the Queen Anne approach is typified by the asymmetrical gable wings and the avoidance of smooth walls. And so uh, they spoke uh, in volume by um, doing it there. They also spoke inside here. And uh, one of the interesting pieces is that these stained glass windows are not story windows. And um, that's, uh, to me, that's a statement. Uh, these are uh, architectural in design, these are floral in design, but at the time, uh, a story window or iconophry was um, the, the norm because there was still a point of literacy and illiteracy, and the story windows would tell the biblical stories through pictures, uh, and so there was an assumption I conclude that there was uh, a level of literacy that didn't require stories in the windows uh, uh, of the church. But they had plenty of decor, they had plenty of stories because uh, these, um, uh, you can see here from this picture of the 1950s, they had frescoes on the ceilings and on all the walls. And uh, the, fresc the ceiling frescoes really in reality are just paint over plaster were executed by George Chapman and George Chapman, and again, my technology has um, failed me here. 
George Chapman uh, is known uh, also as being the um, uh, person who provided the um, frescoes and, uh, in the Sterrett Mansion. And so if you have an opportunity to visit the Sterrett Mansion, you will see his. George Chapman's uh, uh, artwork remains here uh, and uh, on the organ pipes. Um, and unfortunately, it's not going to show. But what happened was, and you can see it uh, from here, in 1950s, there was water penetration, and there's uh, some pictures um, that do exist, unfortunately not on the slide set, but they do exist, where they showed where the um, uh, building and grounds committee of the church struggled mightily to patch and repair the failing and falling plaster. And uh, some of the patches were um, uh, artistically done. Many of them, though, were just big blotches of uh, gray. And so they finally, uh, and as you can see from the back wall here, um, on both sides of the organ, you can see these veins or these river, rivulets uh, of uh, water and uh, intrusion. So they had a mess uh, in here. <laughs> and uh, they decided, uh, regretfully, um, to uh, cover it up. But the good news is, from an arch historical pre preservation standpoint, they took uh, tons and tons of photos. There's about 70 photos. Uh, um, archiving and cataloging each and every one of the facets and the panels on there. And I had two of them on the slide deck, and I apologize that uh, they did not um, uh, come to pass. But um, uh, so that, I think, is a better way of um, uh, than letting the ceiling fall down, is uh, at least recording it and then uh, depicting it. Some of the other things that uh, the church uh, has done and has changed and has uh, allowed itself to um, uh, keep up with the times, this uh, display uh, window back here uh, on this corner um, used to be the entrance to the sanctuary. And uh, it used to be uh, in the 1950s, uh, you would come in um, off of Franklin Street and you'd come right through that um, display case there because uh, back there, that was uh, uh, just a narthex and it didn't have an exit out to, to the parking lot area. And uh, there's a picture from the 50s um, uh, showing that um, uh, area there a variety of additional pieces. If you are on the sides here, you can see that there's holes in um, these uh, pew uh, pieces, and they used to, uh, at uh, a number of times, have long tapers, and they would light it and have a candlelight services. I'm sure it was beautiful. I know it was scary to have uh, these tapers uh, lit there. And uh, so the holes are, remain, but thankfully I have not seen uh, uh, anything as silly as uh, anybody suggests. Let's um, uh, reignite and let's relight uh, that again, because uh, that would not be uh, good. Um, uh, moving, moving on. Um, there is out here uh, some hawthorn trees, the original pastor um, uh, planted those, uh, bringing those original hawthorn trees back from his uh, native Scotland. And uh, we, this last spring, uh, planted a birch tree out here in the Memorial Garden to uh, uh, dignify and to um, memorialize our 150th year. And uh, we hope that that will uh, continue to uh, grow uh, for us. Um, the organ uh, has been a great uh, uh, place of pride, and it's been a great place of um, enjoyment for the church. It was um, placed in 1890 by Wally and Goon. Uh, it is a tracker organ. It originally had 692 pipes uh, in it, and uh, they range from 2 inches to 16 feet in size. They're grouped into 15 ranks with each rank producing the sounds of an instrument, be that a flute, an oboe, violin, and so forth. And as I said, the original uh, organ cost uh, $2,500. It is noteworthy that it is the only organ in, it is the oldest organ in Washington state that was uh, purpose-built in place and remains in the place for which it was built. And so uh, the sanctuary and the organ were designed to get, uh, together. Um, Wally and Goon uh, were, um, uh, ingenious uh, organ designers, but uh, in 1889, since it predated um, electricity, it required a pumper to be in there. And there was a great article in the Seattle Post Intelligencer uh, in 1958, and the title of the article is The Organ Pumper Has Prestige. And uh, in it, uh, it quotes a boy, Chester Flint, Port Townsend resident, 
who recalled pumping the organ from 1897 to 1901. And he says, quote, the organ uh, pumper was quite an important position for without him, the organist wouldn't be able to do very much. He was the source of power for her. Occasionally though, a pumper would drop off to sleep during the sermon. <laughs> the organist would pull a lever on the stop board that would give a little thump and rouse the boy in time for the closing hymn. Tom and I have looked for that lever and we can't find it. Uh, so it is today probably just a pounding on it. Um, a, um, Miss Charles Campbell, a, uh, a member of the choir for over 40 years, can remember performing the task of pumper more than once for a boy who was either detained or forgot to come back. Um, and I have heard uh, that it was said that when Fort Warden um, came to be, that a number of the congregants uh, also served as uh, guards and uh, were at the uh, guardhouse and so forth, and that that would be an appropriate um, penance to come and be a, a, a pumper if you... Um, and it also allowed the guards to be able to keep an eye on the prisoner and uh, come to church uh, with, uh, with his family, it, just as long as they stayed uh, in the back and they didn't scurry out the back door and escape. Um, so uh, the pumper was replaced with the advent of electricity into a blower uh, organ and uh, be able to do that. Uh, in 2002, in 2002, the church invested $40,000 to uh, have a um, 116 pipe rank uh, installed and a, a major uh, refresh, a major refresh of it. And um, uh, we got a lot of accolades uh, on how uh, well it was preserved and how it was uh, working. But in taking off one of the um, uh, plates to do it, they found some graffiti. And uh, during the refurb, they found the uh, graffiti on the back of an access panel. And the graffiti read, quote, this organ was built by Wally and Ganoon, two amateurs. Ganoon was a gentleman and Wally was a redheaded uh, stinker. <laughs> They contend, historians, that um, um, uh, it was Ganoon whose uh, graffiti is seen, and uh, they both went on to uh, build other organs. And so I'd like to invite Tom to come up and to um, uh, see what the red-headed stinkers uh, do, and uh, you, can, uh, you can give a thump on there, uh, or you can press the button to get the uh, blower to, um, uh, to work for you. And I'll try to get my slides to come back into sequence.
Thank you, Tom. We will hear one more tune with Tom, and uh, I will also remind you that um, Tom will be part of our uh, November celebration on Saturday, November 11th, 2 p.m., a full organ concert. Uh, no other technology um, uh, getting in the way of uh, his good music. Uh, I was able to restore uh, and quickly go over uh, the church not only in adapting uh, and changing with the times uh, transition from the entrance, uh, which is now the display case. When you get a chance, go outside uh, into the narthex and look, and you'll see that these panels actually have handles on them. And the reason was is that uh, there was counterweights that, like a garage door, allowed them to lift up the panels, open it up, and increase the, the capacity to over 600. And um, as when this church was um, uh, commissioned in 1889, uh, eight, uh, 1890, all the way through uh, 1900, this was where Port Townsend High School held its commencement. Uh, this was the largest uh, building in town, and this was uh, the, the place where the town, got, where the community gathered for a variety of pieces. And so the counterweights have long since uh, fallen apart, and we can no longer uh, risk uh, lifting up those panels, but uh, those panels uh, served a, uh, a great purpose. Those pulls are still uh, displayed there. Um, discussed about the uh, fireworks uh, there on the pews. Um, this, uh, the town didn't have electricity. Uh, originally, these uh, fixtures were um, uh, coal-fueled, uh, gas-fired, uh, and um, Jeff, who's sitting in the back, has uh, been brave enough to get up into the uh, rafters, and there's a pulley system that allows this um, a chandelier to come to the ground and they used to light it uh, uh, and light the gas and bring it back up. And uh, you can see uh, there, and if you look at a close uh, look, you can see where they used to turn the, um, uh, the gas on and off uh, on these uh, elements. Electricity came to pass and they um, uh, kept the fixtures because they're gorgeous, um, uh, but they wired it uh, for electricity and, uh, and went that route. Port Townsend, um, remember when the church was founded, um, the telephone hadn't been invented yet, but when a uh, telephone came, uh, it came with a passion, and uh, it didn't come without controversy. There was competing telephone um, uh, companies in town. Uh, there was a Sunset uh, and Telegraph, and there was uh, the Port Townsend Citizens Independence. Both of them had different, their own interchanges and their own phone numbers, and they didn't uh, communicate. They didn't uh, coordinate. And so you were uh, a part of the congregation that had a telephone in the directory of Sunset Telephone, or you were a part of the um, congregation that had a telephone number in uh, the Citizens Independent. And um, I know that uh, if they were anything like our current church's secretary, First Press had both telephones sitting on the um, secretary's desk and uh, would dial both of them to, uh, to get the word out and to keep things going. Um, um, they figured out the technology of being able to cross and, uh, and do all of that uh, later on, but uh, uh, that was an interesting way to start uh, the telephone. Since then, we've uh, expanded and included, and we now live stream, um, and we have a very uh, a robust congregation that uh, is uh, digital and uh, watches um, the Sunday worship um, uh, services uh, online, and, uh, and so we continue to adapt with the uh, technology. We continue to minister outside of the walls of this uh, uh, sanctuary, and I contend that that's uh, from the beginning what the congregation's purpose was, is that um, uh, we are reminded that uh, service begins as soon as the worship here is done. And the service uh, is involved with things like ECHO, uh, things like uh, Habitat for Humanity, um, a variety of uh, social justice issues and so forth. Um, the morning leader uh, had a piece and it uh, spoke about uh, the congregation and you notice it's right on the front page of the leader uh, and it talks about uh, the organ and it talks about what is uh, going on and, uh, and so the church, as I said, was uh, very much a part of the community and part of the fabric of it. And uh, here's some of the details in the photos. Uh, the Wally and Ganoon uh, foot pedal has the W and G signature on there. Um, this is uh, the Bellos uh, area that was originally where the pumpers sat. Uh, so that, uh, uh, and that's actually in, 
that door right there, that uh, access door. Um, and some of those pumpers, if they stayed awake, uh, they scrawled their names on there and there's a bunch of, um, um, uh, and I contend that there may have even been uh, some uh, collaborators because there's a couple of uh, JD plus uh, MB and all those kind of things uh, going on back there. So uh, uh, that that's, uh, goes on uh, and m much of it's been painted over, but it's fascinating to look at. Um, we do have uh, the organ and um, uh, I was, uh, every time a pastor has done a time for um, uh, kids and it comes up and a pastor will say, you know, tell me about this organ. And um, there's um, probably some kids that if they had the opportunity to scrawl their name in the back, they would, but uh, they know exactly that there's 35 pipes uh, here. And uh, uh, you ask them and they say, well, what does that remind you of? And you take a look at these pipes and what does it remind you of, anybody? Pencil. A pencil, exactly. However, did you know that the Ticonderoga pencil that uh, uh, looks like this and so forth, that uh, this was not invented until 1913? And so, um, so these organ pipes predated the Ticonderoga pencil. Um, I contend that um, uh, somebody from Ticonder Ticonderoga, uh, New York, visited this church and was inspired. <laughs> and, uh, um, and so um, the pencil um, was uh, produced, and there's a little bit of trivia that you don't need to know about Ticonderoga, and it's now um, closed down in Sandusky, uh, I Ohio, um, and it's now manufactured in Mexico. But uh, uh, our pencil-looking uh, uh, pipes uh, continue on, and they predate uh, the, the famous Ticonderoga number two pencil. Um, Tom will be here on November 11th uh, as part of uh, our uh, ongoing uh, program. Uh, another thing that uh, certain members of the congregation, myself, uh, when I'm not counting the number of pencils and, uh, or pipes, I've always wondered about this placard over here and uh, did a little bit of research and um, uh, Pastor C.W. Smith uh, was pastor of the church uh, and he was a, um, uh, a man about town. He was um, president of the school board. He was, uh, had served a couple of terms as city councilman. Here's a picture of him down by the waterfront um, uh, skipping rocks with uh, some young parishioners. Um, but the front page of the Daily Leader in uh, 1905 had this uh, headline news that says, heaven uh, help us, Reverend C.J. Smith has received a opportunity to accept a call back in his ho old hometown of um, uh, England. And uh, it was front page news and it was a travesty that they could possibly uh, lose him. And uh, there was much conversation and this undated um, uh, Poor Townsend Leader, but many months later, uh, has an article. It's not front page, it's uh, uh, page two or page three. And uh, I've called out the highlighted text, and it says that Reverend C.J. Smith um, uh, solicited to remain within the city. While it may be that it would be pleasant in many ways for him to return to his old home, at the same time, Reverend C.J. Smith has become so Americanized and so much a thorough Westerner through his years of work in this country that it is believed that he will be better pleased here than anywhere else. It is hoped that all, it is hoped by all that he will remain, although he has not as yet given out his intentions. Well, his intentions were clear and uh, he did decide to stay. Um, I do think this is an interesting aside. Take a look at the way that the paper is, um, uh, you've got your news columns printed there, you've got your ads. You can clearly see where the ads and the news delineate, uh, can't you? Well, not so much, because uh, right underneath the story about C.J. Smith, the red highlighted, uh, the article, which is in the exact same font and the exact same piece as hard-hitting news, it's, it says, um, get your dinner at the house restaurant and hotel. Home cooking is a specialty. Open daily at eight. Meals are uh, 16 cents and 25 cents. A bed is 25 cents and 50 cents. C.H. Wright is proprietor. And so uh, even back then, they were having the problem of blurring the uh, pieces between advertising or entertainment and, uh, and news uh, in the leader. But uh, uh, Pastor Smith stayed, and uh, Pastor Smith uh, went on to have a great um, pastorate influencing uh, not only the congregation, but the city until um, Thursday, May 7th uh, of 1908. And on that Thursday, uh, he had a very short uh, illness of um, um, 
Some say it was tuberculosis, others say it was just the flu, but he succumbed to it on that Thursday. And uh, so uh, his pastorate from 1899 to uh, 1908 uh, was over on that Thursday. And you can only imagine what happened at that church um, on that Thursday as both phones were working uh, to be able to um, uh, let the congregation know that on Sunday, Pastor Smith um, wouldn't be there. And they had to find not only a pumper for the organ, but they had to find a, a substitute preacher. And uh, then they did have later on a community um, celebration of his life and a memorial service. And I know that they had uh, the doors flung open and they had every uh, seat uh, in this uh, sanctuary filled. And as you can see, this is the floral arrangement that uh, was a part of his um, uh, memorial service uh, for him. So um, this congregation uh, through the years has uh, definitely uh, been a place where uh, things have uh, happened and um, uh, people's lives have been changed. Uh, They've been ignited and fueled inside to go outside of these walls and uh, to make it happen. Uh, the work that's been done to modify this uh, has been uh, thoughtful. It hasn't been without uh, um, probably stern debate. I know because I've been part of those uh, debates. Uh, uh, the cross was not placed uh, on the uh, in front of this uh, organ until um, uh, 13, 14 years ago, and it didn't go without um, um, issue. The banners that are on the back wall there that have uh, the fruits of the Spirit, those banners uh, hung where hope and love are, and I thought for sure that the banners would A, fall apart because they'd been up there so long, and I thought for sure that the church would split uh, um, because of moving those banners, but, uh, but those things uh, didn't happen, thankfully, and uh, they're still depicted on there. Um, we as a uh, church, we as a denomination, the Presbyterian Church, are not um, uh, real keen to change. I don't know who's keen to change, but um, um, we, the Civil War ended, um, and uh, we, when the first shots of the Civil War broke out, uh, the Presbyterian Church uh, split because they had already been debating in the pulpits for years and years leading up to the Civil War. And uh, the Southern Church and the Northern Church uh, divided. And uh, we in the Northern Church uh, were the United Presbyterian Church. And you could still see out there in the old entrance, you can see beneath the paint, United Presbyterian uh, underneath the first press. It's, uh, it's still faintly visible there. It wasn't until um, uh, 1987 that uh, our denomination figured out, well, I guess the Civil War is over. We should reunite as a denomination and uh, bring that northern and southern half together again. Um, so change has not uh, uh, been easy for us. Um, and uh, yet through it all, uh, uh, in spite of ourselves, we have uh, figured out how to do it. And uh, I do encourage you to um, uh, continue to um, uh, lift us up in support for our next 150 years and, uh, and what we uh, figure out uh, what to do, what are, how we answer the call. And uh, I know that this uh, sanctuary and these four walls uh, will be um, uh, inspirational incubators uh, for the folks that are going out there. And so I uh, thank you very much for um, uh, being here and hearing just a couple snippets of uh, the first 150 years and I encourage you to be part of the next 150. And with that, we'll have uh, Tom send us out uh, and thank you all very much. Thank mm -hmm. you.